Okay, we got you all set. Let's get going. Um, so I want to say hello to everybody and welcome uh, to the uh, first virtual seminar in the 2020-2021 uh, UCLA CTSI Distinguished Speaker Series. Uh, today's talk uh, is in collaboration with the CTSI, the David Geffen School of Medicine Cancer Research Theme, and the UCLA Johnson Cancer Center. To kick off the series, we are really fortunate to have one of our own stellar investigators, Dr. Bill Lowry. I've gotten to know Bill over a decade. Uh, he is an incredibly creative scientist and a, with a strong advocacy uh, and leadership for training and educating the next generation of aspiring researchers. Bill began his own uh, journey at the University of Washington, Seattle as an undergrad, followed by graduate studies at Cornell University, where he earned a PhD in neuroscience. From there, he was a postdoctoral fellow with Elaine Fuchs at the Rockefeller University, uh, studying mainly the biology of stem cells in the skin and, and in skin cancer. He was heavily recruited, uh, and fortunately for all of us, uh, Bill came to UCLA as an assistant professor in 2006 in the Department of Molecular Cell and Developmental Biology. Since arriving at UCLA, Bill has led a highly productive research team that focuses on studies of human pluripotent stem cells and ectoderm differentiation, particularly related to the nervous system and skin. He also has a deep interest and expertise in physiology, metabolism, and pathology, mainly related to intellectual disability in the central nervous system and skin cancer. With all of his accomplishments, of course, Bill rapidly rose to full professor with a joint appointment in the Department of Medicine in the Division of Dermatology, and he is an integral member of the UCLA Broad Stem Cell Research Center. Bill's been recognized for his success with a number of important honors and distinctions, including a Fuller Foundation Award and the Allen Foundation Distinguished Investigator Award, just to name two. His lab is well-funded and he has published over 70 peer-reviewed studies, many in highly influential scientific journals. Bill also has a strong entrepreneurial interest with several patents and numerous active patent applications, mainly in stem cells and hair growth. He is the founder of two companies with UCLA colleagues, uh, Sardona Therapeutics and Pelage Pharmaceuticals. Bill is heavily sought as a speaker on the lecture circuit, as today's kickoff seminar attests, and also as a trusted colleague by uh, many here at UCLA with his enormous insight and wisdom. When he speaks, he has an incredible ability to make complex topics very simple, often adding deep insights with an undercurrent of well-appreciated humor. As I said earlier, he is passionate about training and education. He has mentored numerous high school students, undergrads, graduate students, and postdoc fellows in his own lab, as well as leading training activities in the stem cell biology for the Broad Stem Cell Research Center. Uh, today, Bill's gonna share with us his insights in a seminar entitled, uh, Manipulating Metabolism and Hair Follicle Stem Cells, to regulate activation and tumor genesis. Uh, while you're listening to Bill, please, if you have any questions, uh, enter them in the Q&A box, which is a feature on Zoom on your screen. And one last comment, please remember to vote on November 3rd. So with that, Bill. Thanks, Mike. Well, that was a very uh, generous uh, introduction and uh, it means something coming from you. Um, and I really appreciate the um, opportunity uh, to be invited uh, to speak here um, in this format, uh, and particularly in the um, Distinguished Lecture Series. It's uh, something of a, of a treat um, and maybe a nice way of telling me that I'm getting old. Uh, but anyway, uh, again, I appreciate the invitation and please ask questions along the way. The chat box is open. I will attempt to pay attention to it. Uh, and so as, as Mike mentioned, I'll be talking about uh, metabolism and hair follicle stem cell uh, activation. And it, this work has uh, evolved over the years um, uh, from a very basic idea of let's figure out what makes uh, stem cells activate or uh, return to quiescence. And uh, because of uh, insightful colleagues uh, here at UCLA, uh, like Heather Kristoff and Tom Graber and the whole metabolism community. Uh, we've recently, more recently, become interested in metabolism and are um, trying to figure out how uh, studies of in vivo metabolism of 
uh, hair follicle stem cells uh, can inform us as to how these cells make decisions. And so uh, we also think about where do tumors come from? And I don't know if I have a cursor that works. Can anyone see this cursor? Uh, should have. I don't see it though. You don't see it, okay. Give me one second. Anyway, I'll wing it. So um, in thinking about where do tumors come from, you can see in this um, pathological stain off to the left, uh, there's an image of what the normal skin really looks like. And, and the very top layers there are the epidermis in their normal configuration. Uh, but at some point, uh, uh, squamous cell carcinoma can take over and generate what you see to the right, which is a tumor. Um, and maybe this is still a lowish grade uh, squamous cell carcinoma. And uh, we thought a lot when we started the lab about uh, where do uh, these tumors come from in the sense of what kind of cells do they come from? Uh, what are the oncogenic stimuli uh, that drive this transformation? And what are all the changes that occur uh, to allow these um, giant structures uh, to, to grow? And I'm having trouble advancing the slides. Okay, uh, so one of the big questions um, for today is, you know, what are hair follicle stem cells? Uh, and this is just a primer. Uh, to show you what we know currently about hair follicle stem cells is that they reside in that little uh, area there called the bulge. Uh, and it's the portion of the follicle uh, just below what's called the sebaceous gland, which secretes sebum, or the oil in your skin. And the bulge is connected to something called the erector pili muscle, which I'll talk about in a little bit. Um, and it's that little muscle that contracts to give you goosebumps. And the stem cell niche is the only permanent portion of the follicle because the follicle goes through waves of growth, uh, degeneration, and regeneration. Uh, so this follicle to the left is where the hair shaft is growing out. Uh, but at a certain point, the entire bottom of the follicle is degenerated in a special type of apoptosis. And you're left with a follicle in this catagen and then telogen phase where the follicle is much smaller, but the stem cell niche still resides there at the bottom. And at this point, the stem cells are quiescent, and these follicles can remain quiescent, um, and this follicle, uh, the follicle stem cells remain quiescent for days, weeks, years in some cases of alopecia or hair loss. Uh, but if you're lucky, the stem cells wake up again and are activated by uh, what's known as a secondary hair germ uh, to, to uh, induce a new round of proliferation, which generates a new uh, bottom of the follicle, and you're again left in this antigen stage where the um, uh, follicle is generating hair shaft that's protruding out from the scalp or wherever. And the stem cells at this point return to quiescence. So they're really only um, activated in this transition between telogen to antigen, and that only occurs for a couple of days. And so in fact, the hair follicle stem cells are quiescent 99% of the time. Uh, as I mentioned, they are one of the few permanent cell types uh, of the follicle. Uh, and on the other hand, if you remove them from uh, the tissue, they actually have more proliferative potential than any other cell uh, in the epidermis. Uh, so removed from their confines, removed from their niche, uh, they don't have any inhibitory signals anymore. They actually can divide more uh, frequently than any other kind of cell. And um, another interesting point is that even in cases, most cases of what we call non-scarring alopecia or alopecia uh, hair loss where you haven't lost the actual follicle, the stem cells are still present and they're still viable. And um, therefore, they're still a target to potentially be awakened um, to reactivate uh, the hair cycle. Uh, the stem cells are known to be activated by all the growth factor signaling cascades that uh, you're typically familiar with, like Wnt and FGF, TGF, uh, sonic hedgehog, androgens. Um, every day, there's a new um, known uh, regulator of these things. Um, and it's known that if you can control hair follicle stem cell activation, you can actually control the hair cycle. They're that important to uh, this cycle. And so we've been studying the process by which they activate and then return to quiescence because it's the key to 
um, um, promoting hair growth, but also because it serves as an excellent model for adult uh, stem cell uh, proliferation and, and quiescence. And uh, a lot of what we are learning about these hair follicle stem cells appears to probably apply uh, to other stem cell niches like uh, in the nervous system and maybe the blood as well. And so um, when I started my lab, we thought a lot about um, um, which kinds of cells can serve as cancer cells of origin, back to this question of where do cancers come from? And we um, sought to figure out if stem cells have a higher propensity to initiate a tumor versus all the other cells uh, of the tissue. So we started a molecular genetic approach where we could uh, transgenically deliver activated RAS or delete P53 or both and do so in a stem cell specific population or in a transit amplifying population or in a differentiated population. And this figure is meant to summarize uh, about a decade of work uh, since we started where we essentially delivered those oncogenes to different populations in the skin and then simply asked uh, what was the outcome. And so to the right is the classic case where delivering uh, active RAS and deleting P53 uh, stimulate in, sorry, in just hair follicle stem, cell, stem cells um, initiated a full-blown squamous cell uh, carcinoma. But if you deliver the same oncogenic stimulus to cells just below um, this um, bulge region, you actually don't generate uh, any uh, phenotype uh, at all. Uh, and if you do so during the quiescent phase uh, of the hair cycle, you also don't induce it. So you need to deliver the oncogenic stimulus to the stem cells and you need to do so during the active phase um, of uh, the hair cycle or the active phase of the uh, hair follicle stem cell cell cycle. And if you deliver oncogenic stimuli to cells outside the follicle, you can get growths, but you don't get full-blown squamous cell carcinoma. And so, <clears throat> just summarizing this quickly, is the hair follicle stem cells are cells of origin for squamous cell carcinoma, um, but it also appears as though their natural quiescence acts as a tumor suppressor to keep them from getting um, uh, uh, initiating tumors on a regular basis. Since we do know actually those that have done now sequencing studies on, uh, for instance, scalp skin, it's clear that almost all of our scalp or sun exposed skin has a significant number of RAS mutations already in it. And so one curiosity of ours is why aren't we constantly getting cancer if all of our cells have RAS mutations? And, and we think this is one um, case as to why. And so the other thing I'm gonna talk about is metabolism. And when most people think about metabolism, they think about uh, metabolism in cancer. And this wonderful method that was developed here at, at UCLA, the FDG uh, PET imaging, which uses PET imaging with a glucose analog to identify uh, uh, regions in the body that take up an abnormal, um, abnormally high amount of glucose. Uh, so you do see the brain takes up a lot of glucose off to the left there, um, which is uh, a known um, uh, occurrence. The, the brain uses, I think, a third or a quarter of all the glucose you um, ingest. Um, but what you're meant to see is all these spots um, throughout the um, body, which are signs of metastasis to distant tumor sites. And the idea is that tumors take up a lot of glucose, and so they are uh, very uh, highly contrasted in this PET uh, image. And so what we know about cancer, just from 100 years of um, evidence, is that uh, cancers take up a lot of glucose and they produce a lot of lactate, in a process called the, the Warburg effect. And so just one primer on um, glucose metabolism, glucose comes in and it gets converted by a series of enzymes to pyruvate. And at this point, the pyruvate can either be converted to lactate uh, or it can enter into the mitochondria through a mitochondrial pyruvate carrier and participate in the TCA cycle to drive um, oxidative phosphorylation, the generation of a bunch of uh, uh, ATP. And the one question has always been, why are tumors taking up glucose and producing uh, lactate? And what's the functional consequence of that? And so we have spent some time thinking about this circuit here. Um, the decision by which pyruvate either enters the mitochondria or uh, is secreted uh, to acidif acidify the extracellular environment. And so as part of this, 
we were thinking a lot about hair follicle stem cells that are starting tumors and the tumors presumably are producing lots of lactate and therefore have high levels of LDH activity, uh, this enzyme lactate dehydrogenase activity. And so let's start looking for Warburg in our tumors and when does Warburg happen? Does it happen early, late, uh, et cetera? And so this led to a really interesting um, observation originally by Melina Gregorian, I was in my lab um, maybe 10 years ago. Um, and in, in our efforts to identify a Warburg effect in cancers, she actually made this really interesting observation, which then Amy Flores um, followed up on in this paper, uh, to show that actually the highest levels of LDH activity we could detect were not just in tumors, but they were just in normal follicles. And they weren't just in normal follicles, they were only in this bulge region, uh, the hair follicle stem cell region. And so this is an in situ LDH activity assay, which gives you a color metric readout here in purple of the um, relative activity of this enzyme, which is obviously a key uh, metabolic uh, enzyme indicating lots of uh, uh, conversion of pyruvate to lactate. And so you also see it down in the muscle layer below the skin, that's known, uh, muscles are highly glycolytic. But amongst this various skin cells, uh, it's really confined to this bulge region. In fact, it's the most specific marker of um, hair follicle stem cells that I've uh, observed. And so Amy took, the, took this observation and expanded on it uh, dramatically to show that in fact, if you sort, uh, purify hair follicle stem cells and compare them to all the other cells of the epidermis, and do um, uh, uh, metabolomics based on mass spectrometry readout, um, you find that all the glycolytic metabolites are highly elevated in this population versus all the other cells of the follicle. And um, there wasn't a dramatic so much increase in TCA cycle metabolites, um, but there was a dramatic difference in their uh, glycolytic metabolites. And so this led us to wonder what is LDH doing in those hair follicle stem cells and so we started a protocol where we were asking whether this activity, which was confined to hair follicle stem cells, was important for their regulation. And so what we did was we shaved mice and then we induced deletion of LDHA specifically in hair follicle stem cells and then monitor hair growth. And so on the left, you see a, a cohort of animals that were controlled. They were um, not floxed for LDH, meaning uh, they still expressed LDH. And on the right are animals that were shaved and then uh, we induced deletion of the LDH enzyme just in the hair follicle stem cells. And then we were struck by this pattern of very patchy um, regrowth of hair, whereas the, the controls all regrew their hair perfectly well, the knockouts had these um, patches of hair. And it wasn't as though they were losing their follicles, the follicles are still there, they just are stuck in that telogen or resting uh, phase of the follicle. And uh, one question that comes up is if the pattern is a little patchy, uh, that's because this is a, an inducible uh, Cree recombinase. Uh, and so it happens in a mosaic pattern, about 30% of uh, the target cells get deleted. And so in those regions where you don't see hair growth, uh, the uh, knockout was effective uh, and vice versa. And so this was a, a dramatic evidence that deletion of this enzyme, uh, which was elevated in hair follicle stem cells, um, actually blocks the ability of the hair follicle stem cells to divide. And so <clears throat> um, sharing these data with uh, Heather Kristoff, she had the brilliant idea to um, go after this uh, protein, MPC1, which is a part of this carrier complex that uh, brings pyruvate into the mitochondria. And so we acquired the animals and we set up an equivalent experiment to delete MPC1 just in the hair follicle stem cells to see what would happen. And evidence from lower organisms showed that uh, inhibition or um, deletion of MPC would bias this reaction um, to keeping um, elevated levels of pyruvate in the cytoplasm, uh, which then um, serve as substrate for the LDH enzyme to create more lactate. And so by deleting this carrier complex activity, we could elevate levels of lactate in the hair follicle stem cells. And so we did the same kind of experiment. We shave all the mice and then we just watch for regrowth as a proxy for hair follicle stem cell activation. And on the left, you see the animals shaved after a couple of weeks, they still haven't grown their hair back. Um, but on the right, where we've deleted that carrier and blocked pyruvate entry into mitochondria, you have these um, patches of fur that show up much sooner than in the controls. So 
taken together, deletion of lactate production blocked the activation of these stem cells and promotion of lactate production accelerated their activation. This led us to look for a pharmacological solution to this and turns out there was a, a molecule around for decades called UK5099, which is known to be a pretty specific inhibitor of that mitochondrial pyruvate uh, carrier complex. And when we topically delivered that drug to these mice, in the vehicle, um, after a couple of weeks, you don't really have any regrowth. You're starting to have some pigmentation right um, in the middle of one of those at 12 days. Um, but on the lower panel, you can see uh, pigmentation, which is indicative of activation, and then uh, regrowth of hair after a couple of weeks with this uh, pharmacological inhibition. And so this was pretty exciting. We sought other ways to uh, manipulate this metabolic circuit. Uh, Matilde Miranda, who just received her PhD, or just defended her thesis, I should say, um, in the lab, uh, published a study um, just after that showing that inhibition of electron transport chain um, complexes was able to promote lactate production and actually also accelerate uh, the hair cycle. Uh, so she published that in a separate study. And so we um, gone headlong into this uh, kind of work, thinking about how to make this um, inhibition of pyruvate oxidation uh, uh, a reliable method to uh, reverse the signs of alopecia. And so we've done things like treat them for a very long time. And here's just an experiment where we um, treat uh, with vehicle on the top row. And you see it takes about 30 days for the hair to, to fully regrow. Um, but if you stimulate lactate production, you get an accelerated uh, uh, regrowth. We then have to shave the animals in order to uh, start the cycle again uh, and be able to administer the drug and you see another wave happens. Uh, and so you can get two waves of the hair cycle, or two rounds of hair follicle stem cell activation um, if you promote lactate production in the time it takes the controls to do it once. And of course if you do it for a very long time you get a Trump joke. Okay, so <clears throat> Um, I should also point out that this, this particular drug was licensed um, by a company of which I'm a shareholder. Um, we'll get into that a little bit more. Uh, but Amy uh, Flores started another study to ask whether this uh, uh, pyruvate inhibition is able to uh, stimulate hair growth even in settings uh, where hair growth is technically inhibited. So uh, all I've shown you is in normal hair cycle, you can accelerate the hair cycle with this method. Um, but in fact, she's now got a new study asking whether in this case, uh, very old mice, if you shave uh, very old mice, these are about two year old mice, uh, the, the hair comes back in pretty patchy, indicating that there's portions of uh, the back skin that have follicles that refuse to wake up again. And so their hair follicle stem cells are probably there, but quiescent. And so after 30 days, you get some regrowth, but not much. But if you treat those same mice in the bottom row with uh, uh, the drug that blocks uh, pyruvate oxidation, you now get a, a much more uh, full coat of hair, indicating um, that the hair follicle stem cells have awakened and now uh, regrown hair, which indicates that this method doesn't just work to accelerate the normal process, it can actually um, accelerate the process uh, even in aged mice. And then she set up several model systems um, to look not only at aged mice, but stress-induced alopecia. Uh, so in a collaboration uh, with our friend uh, Yache Su at Harvard, uh, who has set up a stress model of alopecia where she stresses the mice, shaves them, the hair doesn't grow back. Uh, that's sort of indicated here. Uh, but if you stress them, shave them, um, and give them back the drugs that stimulate um, uh, lactate production, you now get a nice uh, regrowth of hair, even in the context of stress. And then Amy set up a third model where, um, you know, everyone knows that chemotherapy causes uh, hair loss because the cells at the bottom of the follicle are the most proliferative in your body and so most sensitive to chemotherapy. Um, what's less uh, well appreciated is that many patients who undergo chemotherapy never grow their hair back and it's not totally clear why, but the stem cells, according to the pathology, the stem cells are still there, and so why aren't they waking up? So Amy set up a model in mice uh, where she had to go through several cycles of chemotherapy treatment, um, but found that um, once you get to a stage where the mice um, are refractory for regrowth due to the chemotherapy, uh, she then treated and found a robust uh, 
uh, stimulation again of, of uh, hair follicle stem cell activation and regrowth. And so this is also dovetailed nicely with studies from human um, where if we are going to be shown that you can genetically or pharmacologically promote hair follicle stem cell activation by manipulating their metabolism, um, but it's only relevant for humans if the same circuit is happening in humans. And so uh, this image is just of a, um, a hair graft, a hair follicle graft, where it's just a single follicle plucked uh, from the scalp of someone due to be transplanted uh, into a non-bearing hair part of the uh, scalp. And we simply took that and um, exposed them to the LDH activity assay. And we saw a robust uh, LDH activity signal in that hair follicle stem cell niche, which is very consistent with what we saw in the mouse. And so we're excited about the potential that human could be as sensitive uh, to uh, MPC inhibition or inhibition of pyruvate oxidation uh, and potentially uh, the drugs that we're developing uh, could work in humans. And so that's uh, a part of the disclosure um, indicated below. And so we feel like metabolism is a great way to regulate these hair follicle stem cells at the very base level. And what we're now thinking about is zooming out a bit to ask what's regulating uh, metabolism in these cells. And so a really interesting study just came out in cell uh, from our friends uh, at Harvard, thinking about goosebumps. So I mentioned in the beginning that that little muscle, the erector pili muscle, is connected to the hair follicle stem cell niche. And when it contracts, the hair stands up, as you see in this image. And that's what gives the sensation of, of goosebumps. And it's thought that this goosebumps or the raising of the hairs is designed to trap heat close to the skin when you get cold. And um, <clears throat> the Schwartz lab, or excuse me, the Sioux lab, and um, Julia Schwartz is the first author on this study, um, published some beautiful uh, images showing that um, if you have the hair follicle here in telogen, and in um, uh, purple or magenta is the erector pili muscle, which you can see extends from that bulge region all the way to the interfollicular epidermis, and that when it contracts, you can imagine how the follicle would then stand up straight. And then wrapping around that muscle are sympathetic nerves. And they actually showed that these sympathetic nerves physically synapse onto the hair follicle stem cells. So here's a little schematic of that, that um, again, the, the muscle non-contracted, uh, but with the innervation there, and then the, the Green balls are meant to indicate the, uh, the adrenaline uh, secreted by these uh, nerves. And then here, when it contracts, you have an increase in uh, uh, ligand for uh, the adrenergic receptor. And so the SU lab was focused the study on the adrenergic receptor signaling and deleting it and showing how it regulates, and eventually showed that um, the formation of goosebumps is sufficient to actually activate hair follicle stem cells. But she didn't go very far downstream to ask, how is the receptor doing that? And so that's where uh, Matilde Miranda's next project picked up in thinking about how does adrenergic signaling work? And um, here's just a little schematic where the adrenergic ligands can ligand or can uh, bind to their receptor, a G-protein coupled receptor, the canonical beta adrenergic receptor, which is coupled to a heterotrimeric G-protein, which is known to then activate adenylyl cyclase, which then generates um, significant amounts of cyclic AMP, and then cyclic AMP can go on uh, to stimulate Kreb, and I'll show you the rest um, in a bit. And so we got uh, tissue from these ADRB2 uh, deletions, and Matilde was able to show that in the normal uh, early transition between telogen to antigen, you have a burst of what's uh, phospho-Kreb, so a marker of activation of adrenergic signaling, you have a burst of uh, PCREB in the hair follicle stem cell niche, but in uh, animals where uh, they deleted that receptor from just the hair follicle stem cells, you don't get that PCREB activation. And the Sioux lab went on to show that in those mice, they don't regrow the hair. The hair follicle stem cells are there, but they're not getting activated. And so Matilde had been actually working on this um, CREB, cyclic AMT CREB pathway for years and showed that 
acceleration uh, or induction of crab activity, in this case through inhibition of um, uh, phosphodiesterase, uh, which regulates cyclic AMP levels, she found that you could dramatically accelerate the hair cycle by stimulating uh, crab. And so we thought a lot about how could crab do this. We had this observation for a few years, and it turns out um, <clears throat> crab is thought to regulate several important aspects of metabolism. So crab uh, can uh, regulate the expression of the GLUT1, the transporter for glucose, um, as well as, intriguingly, LDH, potentially. It's thought to be a, a specific LDH. Uh, uh, LDH is thought to be a specific Krebs uh, target gene. And so <clears throat> I'm going to make a long story short. It's now uh, in review. But what Matilde has shown is that, in fact, cyclic AMP or Krebs stimulation actually induces uh, glycolysis in the epidermis. And so here is that LDH activity assay again, where you don't have much activity except in the hair follicle stem cell niche. But if you add a phosphodiesterase inhibitor or directly stimulate with cyclic AMP or forskolin, uh, which stimulates adenyl cyclase, you have a huge induction of that LDH activity. Uh, and it's pretty um, direct evidence that um, the signaling through sympathetic nerves directly synapsing onto hair follicle stem cells uh, not only accelerates the hair cycle and creates uh, goosebumps, uh, but in fact does so probably through regulation of uh, their metabolic um, pathways, particularly glucose utilization. And so this gets back to this issue of stem cell induced tumorigenesis. We, we showed uh, previously that stem cell quiescence is a regulator of their ability to initiate tumors, and thereby, if you can regulate the hair cycle, you can then potentially regulate the induction of tumorigenesis. And so we go back to the original literature and think about, well, in all those studies that block tumorigenesis from hair follicle stem cells, did they do it because they block some cancer-specific pathway, or did they do it because they simply block the hair cycle? And so that's where this uh, connection between the hair cycle and tumorigenesis uh, comes in. Um, but hopefully I've convinced you thus far that hair follicle stem cells have a unique mode of metabolism, that blocking lactate production um, prevents their activation, and that stimulating lactate production promotes uh, their activation and therefore the hair cycle. But I also told you that hair follicle stem cells are the cell of origin for SCC, and that SCCs are presumably uh, highly Warburg or make lots of lactate. And so is the metabolism of the hair follicle stem cells um, regulating their ability to start a tumor? And does uh, uh, that lactate production influence their ability to make a tumor? And so one brief primer on the Warburg effect, uh, essentially there's a sort of simple scheme, which isn't always accurate, um, that differentiated tissue use um, glucose uh, and oxidize their pyruvate via oxidative phosphorylation and do very little uh, glycolysis. But that in tumors or in embryonic stem cells, uh, they undergo aerobic glycolysis, where mean, meaning even if there's oxygen around, they still choose to convert their pyruvate into lactate. And the question has always been why. Um, it's a very tight correlation. You can see over the years, uh, there's been an explosion of papers about the Warburg effect, and people sort of take it for granted that there's high glycolytic activity in tumors. And, you know, as testified by the PET assay, the FDG PET assay. And so certainly then you would presume that it's important for these tumors, that they must need to um, undergo um, glucose to lactate um, transition for some reason. On the other hand, if you then look for how many papers have actually proven that increased glycolysis in tumors is necessary for initiation or progression, it's a little disappointing, uh, frankly. There's not that many great uh, studies on this, one of which was by Pankaj Seth, who shared the LDH uh, animals, uh, LDH flocks to animals with us. And so we went back a little bit and first asked whether the hair follicle stem cell initiated SCC actually are a war bird. And so we did that LDH in situ assay. We have a plate reader version. We did metabolomics, looking at met metabolite pools. We did glucose tracing, and we looked for evidence, uh, transcriptional evidence for this. And so at the top, you see the kind of tumors we're working with. This is just H&E, um, low-grade, medium-grade, and high-grade tumors all initiated via hair follicle stem cells. 
And then in um, the lower uh, set of four panels, you have LDH activity assay on, again, the control where you see um, a lot of activity in the hair follicle stem cells, um, but only the only other activity is in the muscle down below. But when those hair follicle stem cells initiate a low grade, medium grade, or high grade tumor, it's completely purple, meaning there's tons of LDH activity, evidence uh, for a Warburg transition. And so every way we could measure Warburg uh, indicated a uh, pretty strong Warburg effect, these tumors were making lots of lactate. And so the obvious question was, well, let's delete the ability of the hair follicle stem cells to make lactate, and certainly that's going to affect their ability to make tumors, right? And so it's a little small, but up at the top are H and E for hair follicle stem cell initiated tumors, SCC, and you see the or low, medium, and high grade tumors. And on the next row are actually knockouts. So they do not express LDH. And they, I'll show you in a bit, they don't actually have any LDH activity. Regardless, they make tumors at the same propensity, under the same timing, and under the same volume. Uh, in fact, there's no change in the timing, the degree, the pathology, the immune response, the proliferative rate, EMT, uh, or hair follicle stem cell marker activation. The tumors look identical, whether they have LDH activity or not. Uh, as evidence of that, there's some markers of proliferation, KR67. Um, here it's hard to see, but there's basically no effect. EMT markers, the epithelial marker up here is no different. Uh, the mesenchymal marker, fibronectin, is no different. We had a, a blinded pathologist look uh, for different types of features of tumors and run a real pathological examination on the tumors. And there was no correlation with genotype to phenotype. The tumors looked identical. We did an RNA sequencing experiment to ask um, what's the difference in transcription between LDH expressing tumors versus not expressing. And for the first time ever, in the history of science, maybe, uh, we saw zero uh, gene expression differences between wild type and mutant. Uh, the tumors were uh, completely identical at the, that molecular level, anyway. And then we did an immunological screen to look for different types of immune cells present within the tumors. And I, hopefully you can see that the pattern, again, doesn't correlate with genotype. Um, we did a variety of subtypes of T cells, and we just didn't see any difference. They, they really they really look uh, identical. On the other hand, there are metabolic changes induced by the loss of LDH in tumors. So <clears throat> we did um, LDH activity assays in situ, and, and that's, I'll show it here, that's shown here. So the top row are LDH activity assays on, um, on different tumors from wild type. The second row are knockout, and the third row are knockout genotypically, but according to the LDH pattern, they're actually mosaic. And so the knockout tumors, as you can see, have zero purple activity. They have no LDH activity. This was a concern because there's different isoforms of LDH. We only knocked out one of them, uh, but apparently it was sufficient to delete all the LDH activity. And then we found tumors that were mosaic, where only part of the tumor was knocked out, uh, and still the tumors form that doesn't change the pathology or anything else. And so we measured these things by metabolomics. We did glucose tracing, looking at NA, NADH uh, ratios. Here is uh, one metabolomic experiment with glucose tracing, where essentially we fed the animals uh, C13 labeled glucose and then harvested the tumors and did metabolomics and asked where did that C13 uh, labeled glucose go? And the tumors uh, on the left, uh, you see glucose there at the top um, has a lot of red. Uh, that means a high level of labeled glucose in those tumors. And then you see a lot of um, red um, labeled lactate at the bottom, which means the normal tumors take up lots of glucose and turn it into lots of lactate. That's the Warburg effect. On the contrast, the knockout tumors didn't take up much label and didn't make much uh, lactate with that label. Um, which one might argue, well, is the experiment flawed? I mean, is there something, uh, some reason why uh, the animals didn't absorb the C13 glucose in the knockout and, and does that affect it? And so we actually, um, thanks to Caius Radu and the folks in the 
uh, small animal imaging facility, we did FDG PET on these animals, which was actually really fun to image um, tumors in live animals. Uh, and so at the top here, we these are animals where we took them to the facility, gave them the FDG uh, tracer, and we actually hadn't done this before. We weren't sure if these tumors were even gonna light up, but they do. So the, the red arrows indicate um, uh, tumors on the body of uh, the animal, these SECs. And hopefully you notice that the tumors are quite red, indicating they took up a lot of glucose. Conversely, you look at the tumors on the bottom, and in fact, um, these are all knockout animals, meaning they don't express LDH, but they still make tumors. And so the red arrows point at tumors, and hopefully you can see those tumors are more often green or, or yellow, orange, and not red indicating that indeed that metabolic um, lack of glucose uptake there um, was uh, repeated here with an FDG imaging paradigm, indicating that when you block LDH activity in these cells, not only do you block the production of lactate, there's some kind of feedback whereby the um, uh, cells refuse to now take up glucose. And so they're, I guess they're deciding that um, if they're not able to make lactate, uh, why take up glucose, which is fascinating because they could still take up that uh, glucose to make uh, pyruvate and put that through the TCA cycle, but um, instead they're, they're lowering their glucose uptake, which is something we haven't totally figured out. Down here is just a quantification for that, and I should have said early on we used multiple transgenic models of these, different Cree drivers uh, that both hit the hair follicle stem cell niche. We also use chemical carcinogenesis, all produce the same uh, effect. And I met Tom Graber in a bomb shelter one day years ago and had told him about this experiment. And he said, well, what if you start the tumors and then delete LDH? I bet that's going to starve them. And it was a great idea. So we set up the experiment um, taking advantage of chemical carcinogenesis because um, that allowed us to do a genetic manipulation um, after uh, starting tumorigenesis. And so what's shown here are tumors still formed, even if we started the tumors, um, allowed them to sort of make themselves visible, and then we deleted LDH to ask if they would regress. They did not regress. They continued to advance to full-blown squamous cell carcinoma. And we know the deletion worked because, again, we have that LDH activity assay where here you have non-deleted and then the deleted, the activity was gone, even though we deleted it well after the tumors uh, started. Um, so then the other suggestion was, well, certainly if you promote lactate production, you are going to uh, accelerate uh, or have uh, more um, uh, new tumors or something. And so we did the converse experiment like we had done with the hair follicle stem cells. We deleted MPC in the hair follicle stem cells while um, initiating a tumor genesis protocol. Again, this was chemical carcinogenesis, but it made no difference if you delete MPC and thereby stimulate LDH activity, which is shown down here, uh, you definitely start tumors, and the tumors, again, are indistinguishable uh, in terms of the number, the timing, the size, uh, and all that. And so it appears as though altering LDH activity or altering lactate levels actually had no bearing on, um, on the tumor formation or progression. It only affected their metabolism. And so it reminded me that, well, if you look at hair follicle stem cell markers in these tumors, those markers are highly expanded, meaning the tumors are full of cells that have some expression pattern or look somewhat like a hair follicle stem cells. Not surprising because they came from hair follicle stem cells. And <clears throat> so one thought is that perhaps the tumors show this pattern just because uh, the tumors are made of stem cells. And I'll come back to that in a second. But the other issue was, well, how are these cells getting carbon? If you delete LDH, you block lactate production, but I also showed you that you block glucose uptake. So how are they actually getting carbon? How are they surviving? And one um, thought Heather had was, well, perhaps they're taking up more glutamine, which is an alternative uh, carbon source. And so we looked at this pathway called glutaminolysis, where glutamine can be taken up, uh, converted via an enzyme to glutamate, and then uh, alpha-ketoglutarate, which can then participate in the TCA cycle. The other thing that was just starting to percolate at the time was Ralph D. Baradinas 
showed that tumors actually take up lactate and run the reverse reaction to create pyruvate and then power the TCA cycle. And so we thought, well, maybe if we're blocking their ability to uh, make lactate, that the tumors must be taking up more lactate from the blood because there's about one millimolar lactate floating around in the blood. And so maybe the tum null tumors are just taking up more lactate. They don't, they don't need to make it because they're taking up more. So we did an experiment where we tried to label the tumors with C13 lactate and we saw no difference. So they're not getting carbon from lactate in the circulation. And so how do they do this? And we had an early indication from gene expression data uh, that in fact we saw elevated levels of glutaminase expression, the enzyme that converts glutamine to glutamate. Uh, we saw elevated levels in an old study um, uh, on hair follicle stem cell induced tumorigenesis. That, that enzyme is elevated in these tumors. We um, converted our LDH activity assay to a glutaminase activity assay. We found that the null tumors actually have an increased activity for that enzyme. And we treated animals with C13 labeled glutamine to ask if they were taking up more um, glutamine. And we found indeed they do. Uh, and that's actually shown here, where <clears throat> here the animals, instead of being given uh, C13 labeled glucose, they got uh, C13 labeled glutamine. And on the left, you have wild type animals and they don't take up too much glutamine. Uh, they use it um, to make some uh, alpha ketoglutarate and asparagine, but not at high levels. Conversely, in the LDH null tumors, which have blocked LDH activity, blocked glucose uptake, they actually take up a lot more of that glutamine and use it to make significantly more of those TCA uh, cycle metabolites. And so the obvious question there is that if you block both glucose and glutamine, can you starve uh, tumors? And I'll get back to that idea in a second. But it reminded me of this issue of the Warburg effect and why are all tumors Warburg uh, positive? Why are they all taking up so much glucose and secreting uh, lactate if they don't absolutely have to? And so if you look at broad-based data on lots of um, tumor collections, you'll find that that LDH enzyme this is RNA expression, is significantly higher in almost every tumor you can find. But on the other hand, it doesn't always correlate with patient survival. So if you stratify patients by the level of LDHA expression, you actually find a very much a mixed bag and that there's no tight correlation uh, between LDH expression and, and patient survival. And so perhaps LDH activity is high in all tumors, but it doesn't necessarily need to be to promote tumorigenesis. And then around the time this came out, um, our colleague here, David Shackelford, published this beautiful paper in Cancer Cell showing that in um, lung squamous cell carcinoma, if you block um, uh, glucose utilization with an mTOR uh, inhibitor, um, some tumors didn't respond at all to that. But those tumors were then particularly sensitive to co-inhibition via um, inhibition of glutaminase with the CB839, suggesting consistent with our hypothesis that you need to block both carbon sources because tumors are very uh, metabolically flexible. And if you block one, they just turn up another pathway because they need carbon so badly. And so then back to some speculation. I told you in the beginning that hair follicle stem cells are glycolytic. I told you that the uh, hair follicle stem cell initiated squamous cell carcinomas, right? And uh, that those squamous cell carcinomas are glycolytic. And so the question we have is whether tumors are really glycolytic, not because they necessarily need to be, but because the cell of origin for them is. And if the glycolytic phenotype is, of tumors is simply an expansion of the cell of origin phenotype, then maybe this phenotype is not actually driving tumor formation. So if I told you that the cancer came from CD34 positive cells, and you saw that the tumor was full of CD34 positive cells, you wouldn't be surprised. Uh, but if the marker is instead of CD34, instead it's uh, LDH activity, uh, then maybe it's not so surprising that the tumors are, uh, are replete with LDH activity positive cells, uh, since maybe the cell uh, that gave rise to them is. And if the glycolytic phenotype is driving tumor formation, you would actually expect that inducing glycolysis in non-cell of origin cells would make them tumorigenic. I don't 
have the data to show you here, but we've actually done this and it, it doesn't. So if you stimulate lactate production by a deletion of MPC, for instance, in non-cells uh, of origin, they don't suddenly become uh, tumorigenic. And so it's possible that at least in this cancer with the models we use, uh, that potentially the, the glycolytic or the LDH activity positive phenotype is really more a marker of the cell from whence they came as opposed to a necessity for uh, tumor initiation or progression. And so what are we doing now? Well, we're doing all the same experiments. Um, Berfin Seyron in my lab is doing all these same types of experiments, both in the uh, homeostasis and the cancer model, but for melanoma, uh, using different Cre drivers, uh, different oncogenes. Uh, we're asking whether uh, inhibition or stimulation of uh, LDH activity uh, can affect melanoma initiation or progression. We've got our first batches of animals now. I hope to have some data soon uh, to share. And then what is the effect of blocking glutamine utilization? So we got animals that are blocked for that um, glutamine synthase uh, enzyme, and we are now deleting that enzyme both in normal hair follicle stem cells as well as those uh, that are um, undergoing tumorigenesis. And the same goes for melanocyte uh, stem cells. So we can ask if um, that glutamine uptake is required. And then finally, can we starve tumors to death uh, the way uh, David Shackelford was able to do? Can we delete um, LDH to block glucose uptake and block uh, glutamine uptake and genetically demonstrate the role uh, for these different um, carbon pathways in uh, tumor initiation or progression? And those are very much uh, ongoing studies. So as I run out of time here, I would love to acknowledge uh, my lab. Um, this was probably 10 years of work uh, from the beginning of the old LDH activity assays. And um, uh, a lot of this work has now been published by Amy Flores, uh, who graduated a few years ago uh, and is now a, a scientist at Palage Pharmaceuticals. Uh, Rie Takahashi had a nice study in human uh, hair follicles looking at metabolic pathways and gene expression. Uh, it was published uh, last year. Uh, Matilde Miranda had that electron transport chain paper and has currently that, um, we'll call it the goosebump paper uh, for short, um, is now currently under review. Uh, as I mentioned, Berfin doing the melanoma work. And then uh, several undergrads, Cytel, Jasmine, Genesis, um, uh, have been working diligently in the lab to, uh, to support the grad students uh, and um, the postdocs. Uh, I'd really like to thank uh, Heather's lab and Heather herself, uh, who are constantly uh, answering all of our uh, naive questions about uh, metabolism. Uh, I really appreciate all the fantastic discussions. I'd like to thank the Jung lab, particularly Mike and uh, Xiao Guang, who really um, led the effort to develop novel MPC uh, inhibitors that then became uh, Pelage Pharmaceuticals, which we spun out, and the Collar Lab, which has been at the forefront of developing these in situ metabolic uh, assays, and uh, hopefully we have now assays established for uh, a variety of different metabolic enzymes, so we can look in situ with existing patient material or whatever. Um, that's very exciting. And uh, Nick Graham over at USC um, published a new um, method for differential um, uh, GSEA, uh, taking advantage of some of our data and looking at metabolic pathways using strictly RNA expression data, which is fantastic. And then the Sioux Lab at Harvard, which has been uh, very generous sharing uh, data and tissue samples um, and lots of interesting uh, discussions. And of course, I'd like to thank funding from the Cancer Center, NIAMS, uh, UCLA, uh, TDG, uh, et cetera. And so I will stop there and see if there are questions. Bill, um, uh, this is Mike. Uh, can you look in the uh, Q&A? I think there's, uh, looks like three questions or at least one question. I see no questions in the okay. Q&A. If you can't see oh, it. Q and A is different than chat. I'm sorry. Yeah, that's okay. I've been missing. Have a look in the Q and A. Okay. So um, 
In addition to MPC activities in SEC, are there other defects in mitochondrial enzymes involved in uh, aerobic glucose metabolism? Is there any difference between the tumor cells of the outer layer, which has more supply of glucose versus the inner region, which has less glucose supply? That's interesting. Um, so we've done metabolomics, uh, both pools and glucose tracing. Uh, for lots of these tumors, we really focused on the glucose utilization pathway and pyruvate and the TCA cycle, but we should really go back and look for other differences. Um, we, I think we took a very myopic view. We saw what we were <laughs> interested in and ran with it, uh, but you're right. We should definitely go back. Um, there's potentially lots of other compensatory uh, mechanisms. As far as inner versus outer region of the tumor, when we do the in situ activity assay, we can actually see the whole tumor with regards to the LDH activity. I don't think um, we've seen a correlation between the inside and the outside of the tumor. Sometimes tumors are patchy. Most of the time they're pretty completely uh, positive, uh, but I don't remember ever seeing a, a correlation to inside versus outside. Uh, next is Martin has a question about sex differentiation in the metabolism of the hair uh, stem cells relating to human sex differences in scalp hair maintenance. I think I can get at the first part in that we typically study male mice for this because there is a sex difference between male and female mice in the hair cycle uh, in mice, uh, in that it starts at a different time and it's less synchronous in female. And so it's much easier to get clean data in the male. Uh, but many of the experiments we've done, we've also done on female and found the same types of things. It's just the data aren't as clean because it's projected over a much longer uh, time course. And whether that relates, if the difference in the hair cycle between male and female in mice is related to anything between male and female in human, uh, I don't know. Uh, there's a lot of similarities in the hair cycle between human and mouse, um, but there's also significant differences. So I'm not sure that it, it tells you much about the human. Uh, Claudio, oh, did somebody say something? Oh, no, it was a horn. Uh, Claudio says, uh, when you inhibit MPC, are you increasing proliferation of the hair follicle stem cells? And what effect are you having on differentiation of stem cells? So the remarkable thing is that, yes, you are increasing the proliferation, but only briefly. So you're accelerating the normal cycle. Remember at the beginning, I said that stem cells are quiescent until they activate, and then they return to quiescence. So the MPC inhibition or elevation of lactate actually um, shortens that quiescent phase, but doesn't mean that you're extending the proliferation phase. You're not making more hair follicle stem cells. The cycle still continues, even though you're still, the way we do the genetic deletion, you're still elevating the lactate levels, presumably, the stem cells are still able to return to quiescence and go through a new cycle. What's happening is that quiescent period is shortening. So we think it's lowering the threshold for that decision uh, to be made. As far as differentiation, we don't think it has an effect at all because when you inhibit it, they, even genetically, the, the new follicles that grow look perfectly fine and they look fine over years, whether you do it pharmacologically or, or genetically. Siavash, I knew, I knew Siavash was gonna ask about pH and I don't have a good answer. He's asking if decreasing lactate production changes the pH of the tumor microenvironment. And I don't know, uh, I've been tempted over the years to get one of these pH reporter mice. I don't know. There are people who have argued, particularly in the stem cell field, that the role of uh, glycolysis is actually to secrete lactate for the purpose of um, increasing extracellular acidification. And it's the extracellular acidification that actually drives the stem cell fate. And I, I just don't know the answer uh, to your question. I, I guess it's possible. Um, secondarily, he asked whether topical application of lactate rescues hair growth. Topical application of lactate was something we did with the um, Christoph lab, and to my surprise, it actually created a ton of inflammation. And maybe this is a finding we need to follow up on, whether it was because it's lactate or because it was acidification of the epidermis, but we got a huge hyperproliferation 
and no necessary um, no effect on um, uh, the hair cycle. So I'm I I don't know what to make of that experiment, but we should get back to it. I think. Um, uh, Claudia has another question. The transition of cancer stem cells to a quiescent state creates huge issues of resistance to cancers to treatment. If you block MPC, can you force the cancer stem cells out of quiescent and make them more sensitive to chemotherapy? Very good question. I have no idea. Uh, it would be a little tricky um, to do it on a cancer stem cell specific basis. Um, but I do, I have always wondered, there are people who argue that MPC inhibition um, should promote tumorigenesis because you're in increased lactate levels, but there's others that argue the opposite, that maybe it could be an anti-cancer, um, perhaps because of what, are your, what you're talking about. We don't have any evidence from the experiments we've done thus far that it makes any difference in the rate or the degree of tumorigenesis or anything else. Um, but we haven't then um, tried a chemotherapy response. Uh, yeah, that's a very good question. Um, Anish. In the LDH knockout tumors, is the lack of increased uptake of C13 lactate that you showed perhaps due to the uptake in lactate getting rapidly metabolized to pyruvate? Um, I guess that's possible, but then we would have seen a big increase in pyruvate, which we didn't see. I didn't show it, I only showed you the lactate, uh, but we didn't see it. Uh, but we have those data, we can go back uh, and look more carefully you might expect to see that. Uh, it's true. It's a good question. I don't quite know the answer, but I don't think that's the case. My big question has always been, and this is something I badger Heather about all the time, why are the stem cells making lactate? There's one millimolar lactate in the blood. There are um, MCT transporters that you can use to take up lactate. It's in the blood. Why are they bothering to make it when there's one millimolar floating around? And in that case, why does blocking the lactate production have such a profound effect on these stem cells, again, if there's so much lactate sitting there, they could just get access to it. Uh, so I, I don't have a good answer to this lactate issue. Oh, can I ask you a question? Yeah. Um, I can't type in the, in the Q&A, so I have to do it. <laughs> yeah. Um, so you mentioned earlier, it's pretty striking finding that cancer patients who get chemotherapy uh, can reactivate their inactive uh, hair stem cells. Um, and when you inhibit uh, MPC1, I guess it was. And I wondered if different types of chemotherapy uh, cause you different reactivation uh, abilities or kinetics. Well, the, the prime example, the one I get emails about all the time are from women taking Taxidere. Uh, and apparently there's a lawsuit uh, forming. Um, and so th I don't know what it would be about that particular one. I don't know, um, you probably know better um, the biology of that particular um, uh, but it was taxidermy, particularly for breast cancer patients, and something like 10 to 15 percent of them uh, never grow their hair back. And they send me their pathology, so I can see their follicles, and the stem cells are still there. Um, and so, why aren't they getting the signals? Because the, the chemotherapy hasn't wiped out the niche. The niche is still there. They should still be getting the same signals. Uh, and so, I don't quite know why it's blocked. Uh, but I was happy to see that inhibiting MPC was able to reverse uh, that block. Uh, but again, that's sort of a mysterious thing. Uh, it's a nice observation, but we don't know why. And, and maybe one more just small question. Um, when, when you uh, looked at tumors that uh, couldn't make lactate and, and they shut off their glucose import and they began to import a glutamine and they yeah. induced in glutaminase and so forth, um, I think you said that it made a lot of alpha KG and routed that into the TCA cycle, yet these tumors are still highly proliferative. So do you have any idea where they're getting their carbons, uh, if they're burning a lot of their uh, glucose or glutamine, excuse me, into CO2? Yeah, I, you know, perhaps I oversold that they're not taking up glucose. They, they do take up some glucose, so maybe it's sufficient to make amino acids and nucleotides and that kind of thing. Um, but where are they getting the bulk of their energy? Maybe that's through the glutaminolysis and the TCA cycle. Um, uh, it's not zero glucose, it's just much, much less. And so it's, I think it's too simplistic to say that tumors are powered by uptake of glucose and secretion of lactate, um, because there's, I think, more going on. Your talk is super interesting. There's two more uh, questions in the, in the Q&A. Uh, uh, Nicholas, uh, um, do upstream regulators like insulin affect tumor growth? In this model, I have no idea. 
Um, we haven't uh, tested it, but um, insulin, IGF, IGF-4, receptor tyrosine kinase certainly is known to promote um, a metabolic um, response, particularly with respect to glycolysis, uh, but we haven't actually tested it in our model. It would be fun to test that in the LDH deletion model to see if insulin has a non um, uh, glucose utilization pathway effect uh, on tumors. Uh, I don't know. I don't know the answer. Um, Claudio has another. Do you think the effect of lactate inhibition on stem cells could be related to epigenetic changes caused by reduced metabolic signaling from the mitochondria to the nucleus? Yes. <laughs> I don't know more than that. Um, lactate, because it's been around for 100 years and it's been a mystery as to why tumors are making it, um, there's tons of theories about what it's doing. I kind of like this idea of the extracellular acidification. I like the data around the lactate influencing the immune response. Um, so one thing we haven't done enough of is look at animals that have a blocked immune system. Um, you know, are these effects the same in nude mice or skid mice? Uh, because the most glycolytic cells in the skin, I didn't show you, are actually immune cells. So if you do single cell analysis, the most predicted glycolytic cells are immune cells, and they're known to be regulated by their um, um, uh, relative levels of glycolysis. And so what's the lactate doing with respect to the immune cells? Are the tumors secreting lactate as a signal to immune cells? Um, the other thing is that lactate itself is a ligand for a GPCR. That's interesting, uh, GPR81. And now I showed you that um, downstream of canonical GPCRs, you can regulate cyclic AMP, CRAB, and then uh, metabolism. And so is there some uh, loop uh, there? I, I don't know. Uh, with regard specifically to your question of epigenetic changes, I don't know. We haven't measured. Totally possible. Um, I do know, I always feel as though the metabolic changes are much more rapid than the epigenetic changes. And so which is more uh, profound with respect to how the tumor is um, behaving or evolving, uh, I can't say, but it's, it's a good question. M Manish has a nice comment for you in, in, in the, in the Q&A. And then uh, I, I, just, I just wanna say on behalf of uh, the CTSI Distinguished Speaker Series, uh, what a great start. And thank you so much for taking a huge number of questions from a really interested crowd. So great, great talk there. My pleasure. Thanks for uh, making me feel like a scientist today. <laughs>